Okay. Kia ora. Nā mihi nui kia koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, I'm Barry Coates. I'm the CEO of Mindful Money. Uh, we're an organisation, a charity that is trying to make money a force for good. Um, this is uh, the part of our series on ethical investing. It's the sixth in our series. We've uh, uh, so far talked to lots of interesting people about uh, how to invest uh, ethically. And last week we had a slight uh, uh, detour and we looked at the budget. Um, so all of these uh, are available on our website, www.mindfulmoney.nz. So you can go and have a look at the YouTube recording and or a helpful summary. Um, today, this one is on the role of an independent financial advisor. Um, I'm joined uh, uh, today by Roger Spiller. I'll introduce him in one second. But first, a few kind of um, running rules for participants. Um, sorry to be an autocrat, uh, but those of you who are on Zoom, um, you will be muted. Uh, and uh, your, your uh, screen image will be turned off. Um, those of you um, who are on uh, Facebook, um, you can send us questions or comments at any time using the, uh, uh, the comment section uh, of Facebook. Those on Zoom can use the chat box, uh, so please uh, feel free to do so uh, regularly and liberally as we go along. We'll talk for about 15 minutes and then we'll have Q&A. Uh, so I've got a colleague who'll send, send the questions through from, from Facebook and we'll, we'll directly use the Q&A from, uh, uh, from Zoom chat. I hope all of that is very clear. So um, uh, feel free to put it in the chat box if it's not. Um, without further ado, so uh, welcome to, to Roger. It's fantastic to have you here, Roger. Thank you for joining us. Um, Roger's been one of the pioneers of ethical investing in New Zealand. Um, he studied accountancy, but uh, uh, so did quite a few other people. Um, um, and he went on to get a PhD in ethical business and investment. Over the years, Roger's played a key role not only uh, in um, sort of advising on uh, ethical investing, He's also helped establish some of the key business and investment organizations in New Zealand. Uh, he's now an authorized financial advisor and is certified as a responsible investment advisor. So uh, very warm welcome, Roger. Uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much, Barry. It's a real pleasure. And as an authorized financial advisor, I just need to give a little comment at the outset that my disclosure statement is available free of charge and on request. We'll have a slide at the end of the presentation which has got my contact details. We also need to highlight that this is a class investment service, so I'm not giving any individualized advice and it comes with the usual disclaimers which we'll also have on that slide at the end. Good, yeah, and uh, thanks for that, Roger. I realize that, that uh, um, the the financial advisory industry is is uh, quite tightly regulated, and uh, these statements that that you make at the at the start are very important. So so uh, thanks for that. And um, let's let's dive straight in. So so can you trace for us the evolution of of ethical investing in New Zealand? So so what are the early days? How did it, how did it start? Well, the journey really began in a very significant way back in 1973. And at that time, we had Nelson Mandela in jail, Robben Island in South Africa, tremendous courage and vision and leadership fighting anti-apartheid, and really leading the apartheid, the anti-apartheid movement and saying that he wanted investors around the world to divest from South Africa. And for us in New Zealand, that was a particularly interesting opportunity because we had something that white South Africa really wanted, which was rugby. And there was a lot of interest. But for the first time in 1973, we had a major company, in this case, NZI, New Zealand Insurance, 
facing a motion from a shareholder. This was Nancy Sutherland, a pioneering woman and significant investor in the company. And she said that she wanted the company to divest from its activities in South Africa. And she was joined by students throughout New Zealand who had brought shares in the company so they could have a vote. She was joined by religious organizations and other individuals, and they all came together from having had a very sleepy AGM the year before with 60 people, suddenly 400 people descended on the office of NZI in Queen Street and really took to heart this, uh, this challenge. Subsequently, Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu said that that divestment movement was absolutely critical in terms of bringing about that change in the apartheid regime. So for me, as a teenager in the 70s watching that, I thought, wow, this is a very powerful way to make a difference, to make a contribution. I want to get involved in ethical investment. And that really set the scene for me, lit a fire in my belly to go on. And sure, I studied accounting with a lot of other people, but I studied accounting for social responsibility as the last module of the last paper and was so impassioned I got the senior prize and that inspired the masters, the PhD and everything else. So it's been a, a really fantastic journey since then and great to see and take our hats off to those early pioneers. Yeah, yeah. And for for today's rangatahi, they're, they're uh, kind of engaging with the divestment from fossil fuels. So, so $12 trillion uh, has been divested worldwide and uh, uh, we've got a pretty active divestment movement in, in New Zealand as well. So I guess these uh, uh, these parallels can continue and uh, a new phase perhaps is is waking up. So so what what happened then? What's the next step on the on the pathway? So into the 80s we had some community-based savings and loans initiatives which were launched. But when I joined the investment industry in 88, there was a whole chicken and egg scenario. You had fund managers saying, we can't launch funds because there's no demand. And you had investors saying, well, you can't invest because there's no funds. So that created a dilemma and I had to look overseas for my clients. I went firstly to Australia where things were really starting to get going there. And just to give an example of how things have evolved, I was working with the founders of a company that's become known these days as Australian Ethical Investment. Back then they were launching and saying, can we raise $6 million? Today, they've got $3.87 billion in funds under management. So absolutely massive transformation. And we brought them across to New Zealand, went to the UK looking for funds there. The first fund got launched in 84. By 89, there were 17. So I could tap into them for my advisory work. Went to the US. And there, there was really interesting work going on around researching companies and looking at how do you produce a profile, a scorecard, if you like, of the environmental, the social, and the governance performance of companies. I worked with some people called Kinder, Leinenberg, and Dominey. They were just literally sitting around the kitchen table, getting going with their business. And again, a sign of the times, they were subsequently acquired by a very large multinational and now in that business, there's 130 dedicated analysts doing nothing but that kind of research on a day-by-day -day basis. And we sort of fast forward, if you like, to 2001 and the launch of the Super Fund with its remit for ethical investment. I was involved on the nominating committee there and really keen to ensure that the Guardians had a strong ethical investment flavor and orientation, which they did. They signed up for the principles for responsible investing and have taken a lead. And then in 2002, hallelujah, we finally had a local fund manager who was willing to launch a fund. I worked with them. I took the research and the framework I'd developed in my PhD, created these scorecards mentored by the Kinder Leinenberg and Domini folks from the States and really got engaged with developing that and then subsequently a KiwiSaver version. And more funds came to the market and things moved along progressively. But the big watershed moment came in 2016 when we had an investigation from Radio New Zealand and the New Zealand Herald. I'd had a bit of a role in the background with this research, but suddenly it became public knowledge that people were investing unwittingly in tobacco, controversial weapons, and massive change happened. A hundred million dollars were shifted in the first month after that publicity came out. And everybody was asking the question, 
And from my perspective, it was quite amazing to watch fund managers who for years, in many cases, had proudly proclaimed they didn't want anything to do with this ethical investment business. Suddenly they were having a road to Damascus conversion experience and, oh yes, we're ethical and this is how ethical we are. And it's now created a whole new challenge. Speaking of the regulator, the Financial Markets Authority has now come out and said, goodness me, you know, we really have to look at all these greenwashing claims and it should be possible for an investor to really clearly understand just how green, how ethical, or how responsible a financial product is. Yeah. So we've now and got a lot more offerings, but a real need to be able to sort out just what's going on and be able to filter the, op the opportunities for investors. And it is one of the reasons we set up Mindful Money, because in amongst all these claims about ethical investing, um, there, is, there is kind of one objective touch point, which is what companies are invested in. Uh, and that's a, uh, a kind of form of radical transparency that Mindful Money brings to, to the picture and, and shows the reality of where the money goes, uh, yeah, aside right. from all the marketing slogans. And, and so we also do research. And one of the, as you know, one of the things we found recently is that many of these funds have a policy not to invest in nuclear weapons. We found $100 million of KiwiSaver funds invested in nuclear weapons manufacture from from New Zealand. So, so uh, um, we'll be uh, carrying on some of those research reports. We've got some uh, really interesting ones coming up. And but as you say, I mean, it's all in a way it's shifting now from just telling people about ethical investing to be able to to ensure that the products on offer are credible and they do what they say on the tin. So, um, so how would you characterize the state of ethical investing in New Zealand now and, and other dimensions around kind of how we are compared to international uh, ethical investing movements? You know, we we kind of ahead of the game. Are we uh, uh, are we kind of way behind? Well, as a individual investor level, where behind in terms of the opportunities that are available for individual investors. So at Money Matters, what we're continuing to do is to bring to New Zealand new funds, and we've been doing that just in the last few months, where we have investors with millions of dollars who are willing to seed and provide the funding to bring across particularly higher impact funds, funds that are making a real difference in terms of issues like the sustainable development goals and enable an investor every year to see just how their million dollars impacted in terms of climate change issues, education, health and well-being, and other SDGs. So we think that in terms of possibilities, there's still a lot of raising of the bar, if you like. You've mentioned that quality issue before, where we're looking to the New Zealand industry, we're in, very encouraged by the increasing supply, but wanting to ensure that we've got the quality there alongside the quantity. And we can look to Australia, we can look further afield, and there are many sort of wholesale opportunities that we're accessing at an advisor level that are very exciting and bring investment technology that previously was not available for sustainable and responsible investors right to the fore. So it's encouraging times. We've seen some great initiatives at an institutional level. So we do see the Sustainable Finance Forum that you, know, you and I have both been working on outlining a map and providing a, a sort of way forward, if you like, in terms of the challenges that we face as an industry, a need to shift mindsets from that sort of traditional view where it's very short term orientated, it's very narrow in its focus, and it's pretty light. I talk about moving to a wider view, a whole stakeholder view, looking at a longer term view, not just next quarter's bottom line, but even thinking intergenerationally and Maori culture has a lot to teach us you know, in that context and also a, a deeper view rather than this lighter view and really getting into the nitty gritty of things like who is leading the companies that we're investing in and how are they continuing to develop their leadership. And for, for my part, whilst you know, we see the New Zealand Super Fund having taken the lead in various ways and some really interesting developments with KiwiSaver, there's a lot more work to be done. And at an advisor level, which is you know, my primary focus, I see a real need for more advisors 
to get engaged with their clients, to have yeah. the conversations with clients about what do they care about and how can that be reflected in their portfolios. Cool. So let's let's move to to this uh, uh, issue. Can, um, not everyone is kind of really uh, probably up to speed with the role of an independent financial advisor, uh, particularly one that focuses on uh, an issue like responsible investing. So, so can you just out outline what what the role and and, and why people would would approach uh, a financial advisor? Well, working with a uh, ethical advisor for your financial journeys like working with a medical doctor so there's three parts really to the process there's the diagnosis then there's the prescription and then there's the monitoring so as an independent doctor come along and you have a conversation and it is all about where are you now where are you wanting to get to so taking stock of that and then doing a deep dive into your values. What's really important for you? What's of impact you want to make in your personal life and the wider community and the wider world? How do you want your money to matter? And exploring what are the issues that you want excluded from your portfolio? Thinking about what are the issues you really want to support and invest in? So exclusions might be fossil fuels, might be tobacco, gambling, those traditional things. But you might say, well, I really want to invest in initiatives that are making a difference for that UN vision of a sustainable world in 10 years time. In this next decisive decade, I want my money to matter to count. So I want to be in support of you know, electric cars, you know, for example, water, sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. So give me companies that are really impactful there. And then there's that third aspect of engagement. I want to invest with fund managers that are really engaging with companies and pushing them and encouraging them to keep on improving. So we think about those issues in terms of taking stock, where are you now, where do you want to be, what's your ethical profile? And then we need to think about traditional issues of risk profile and thinking about where does an investor sit on that spectrum. But what we can see oftentimes with ethical investment is there's an opportunity to actually reduce the overall risk profile that might otherwise be taken because there are lots of investments in traditional investment portfolios that are arguably higher risk than investors realize that they are, not the least of which is you know, some of those oil stocks that you know, we've seen get into such sort of strife in terms of having all those reserves that are on the balance sheet that may not be realized in practice. But also to just think through opportunities for return and more innovative and progressive companies. And this third aspect of having a real world impact. So we think about what's the mix of investments between cash, fixed interest, property and shares, What's the optimal combination you're going to need? So having taken that whole process on board and diagnosis, we then prescribe a plan and say, okay, this is how we can get you to where you want to be. This is what you need to do in terms of investing X amount of money into X profile in terms of growth or balanced or defensive, as the case may be, do a whole lot of financial modeling and working the things out. And then a bit like the doctor, we're saying, what are the medicines or what are the underlying funds, if you like, that we'll bring together and in what combination. And in that context, again, it underlines the importance of independence because you want someone who can step back as the buyer's advisor and say, you know, in a typical portfolio, we might have 10 different fund managers, 15 different funds, different styles of funds management. And so we'll prescribe a plan that shows the investor how to get to where they want to with those investments. And then we'll implement and monitor that. And because change is the only constant, and change in the individual circumstances, the wider world. We've seen massive change recently, of course, in terms of markets. We're monitoring those changes. We're looking at are those current funds, is the current medical prescription, the, the funds that we've got prescribed, are they optimal? Are some of these new funds going to be better for the investors? And how can we measure what's going on in terms of impact ongoingly, reporting that to the clients and looking to ensure that things remain optimal both for their personal lives and their impacts and their wider societal impact. Cool. So how, you know, if somebody wants to, to use a uh, financial advisor, um, what, what advice can you give about how they would choose uh, an ethical investment advisor? Well, in terms of choosing is sort of three kind of key criteria. I think the first one is independence. So it's kind of tough to go to the bank and expect the bank to recommend anything other than the bank's product and what the bank's got on its recommended list of courses, all that's available. So if you go to a fund manager, of course, it's gonna be hard for them to tell you that their fund isn't the optimal one. 
So in the first instance, independence, and that's a pretty key thing, regardless of whether it's a conventional or an ethical you know, advice scenario, have they got that objective lens for you? And then when we're thinking about ethical investment, how open are they to this conversation? It's just incredible for me to find when we do research and talk to colleagues out there, so many still denouncing and discouraging ethical investments as though it's something that's going to necessarily, you know, massively increase your risk or reduce your return or something that you just can't do because it's just too hard and too complex. And if that's the message that you're getting, then I'd encourage you to keep asking the advisor to up their game and learn some more. And if that all fails, then find an advisor who's an ethical investment specialist if you're not getting the level of answers and the quality of the advice that you're looking for. And for a specialist, you're looking for how much experience have they had in the ethical investment sector? And what's their education in this area? And are they a responsible investment association certified advisor, which should really be you know, as a minimum in terms of providing the advice that you need. Yeah. So we have uh, on uh, the Mindful Money website a uh, uh, an identification of, of the advisors who are certified by the Responsible Investment Association of Australasia and uh, and also a list of, of members of that organisation. Um, Roger, I'm kind of aware that, that uh, questions are starting to come in. So for those of you online, uh, uh, you know, make sure you get your questions in now before you forget them. We'll uh, we'll move to to uh, doing a Q and A. Um, but but the questions just come in from uh, Facebook to say, what are the costs of using a uh, a financial advisor? Well, typically, if we look globally at the costs of using a financial advisor, the percentage that's typically quoted and for example with ourselves the first million dollars that someone invests with us is at one percent that's plus gst and it's usually tax deductible and so you can then sort of say oh goodness me you know that's something i wish i could avoid <laughs> and uh, it's interesting to look at some of the commentators who talk about the value added by that one percent one of those is a chap called nick murray who writes quite frequently in the u.s context and he talks about how the average investor in the average US equity fund, just the average performing fund, misses out on 6% per annum in terms of foregone return by virtue of all the behavioral mistakes that people made make left to their own devices. So it's a, there's a real challenge in terms of issues like over diversification, under diversification, euphoria, a lot of panic in recent times, speculation, et cetera, et cetera. And so his basics sort of argument is to say, well, if you think about 1% as the cost, don't you think that's more than likely to be added to the, the value of your portfolio every year? But in terms of increased return, saving you more than 1% a year in mistakes that you might make otherwise, or saving you time, effort and worry that's worth more than 1% a year to you. And given a professional advisor might do all those things, then hiring advisors a non-decision decision, he says. But for me, I think one of the things to really stress is you know, I've got clients who have millions and millions of dollars. These are very smart people. They've made a lot of money in business, medical specialists, business executives, and they know that they don't know, that they need a specialist and the value that can be added in that process. So whilst we have that natural Kiwi thing to do it yourself, you, know, you might mow your own lawns, you might paint your own house, as Nick Murray would say, but when it comes to looking at your personal finances, he describes it as like heart surgery. So do you want a really good doctor on the job or are you going to do it yourself? Yeah, yeah. So without without wanting you to give up all your all your secrets, um, so how, how, how do you kind of uh, choose an ethical fund? And uh, what are the dimensions? What are the key things that, that uh, you look for and that people should be aware of? We can start with how we choose from a conventional point of view. When I joined the industry, I was running the New Zealand research business of a company called IPAC Securities out of Sydney. And they had a four P's framework, which went on to be very influential in the way the industry has developed since that time. In the first instance, they look at the people. You know, who are the people involved in this organization? How are they running? So how committed are they? You know, we could say in terms of ethical investment, what's their background and orientation and their values? And then we can think about their process. How is it that they're implementing the way in which they're applying the philosophy of the fund? 
thinking about how they make decisions, how optimized is that? And then a bit like what you said before with the portfolio, looking to see with the portfolio whether they do what they say they're doing. <laughs> they might say on the tin they're this, but they might actually be that. So portfolio and looking at the nitty gritty of the fund. And then funnily enough, people might scratch their heads watching this. IPAC put performance last. And they said, well, that's a bit like driving a car looking in the rear vision mirror. What we need to understand is future performance. And it's those issues around people, around process and around portfolio that are really driving that. So there are a number of specialist research organizations these days who provide very comprehensive reports on many of the funds. So before recommending and say bringing to New Zealand these recent deeper impact funds, we had several reports done, which were 15, 20 pages in length, quite a lot of industry talk and very technical in some ways you almost need a PhD to understand them but basically telling us about the strengths and the weaknesses and how to combine these funds and where they sit on a recommended spectrum so we do all of that and then we think about how are they going about their exclusions how are they going about including and focusing on the best performing companies and what is their level of engagement are they turning up at those shareholder meetings how are they voting What's the quality of the environmental, social and governance, the ESG research that they're either undertaking or that they're buying into for themselves? What are the screens that they're applying? And there's a whole range of some criteria that Mindful Money is so brilliantly highlighting around transparency. You know, are they walking the talk? Can we see that they're doing what they say they're going to do? So there are a lot of considerations. There's a lot of subtleties involved. And then we bring together the best of those in an optimal combination. Cool. Um, we've got, uh, we're going to go to a few questions now. And uh, uh, first, um, Andrew on um, Zoom has asked a couple of really good questions. So let's take the first one first. Why is the, why has there been a shift from using the term ethical investing, which is generally the kind of term that the public knows about, to responsible investing? which is the term usually used by the industry insiders. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, having been involved since the very early days, we had the Ethical Investment Association in, firstly in Australia, we brought it to New Zealand, so it became Australasia. And then a big debate about would it change to responsible investment? And it, to be sure, it reflected a focus on trying to capture more of the institutional side of the industry. So less worrying about individual investors and what they might relate to more thinking about these big fund managers who as I mentioned earlier oftentimes have had a bit of a phobia about the word ethical oh, God, oh goodness me you know it might mean we're taking account of values and it's kind of ironic because they're always taking account of values that's just what they're valuing is the key issue yeah. but that's the shift really so when we look at Australia many of the retail advisory firms my colleagues there will call themselves ethical investment x y or z um, whereas the fund managers, absent people like you know, the Australian Ethical Investment Organization, many of them these days are focusing more on the responsible side of things and it's more the industry speak. As an advisor, we have the certification and we can choose, do we want to have the responsible investment version or the ethical investment version? And you know, it's a uh, interesting yeah. question. It is an interesting question because it brings up some other stuff as well. So ethical investing has often been more associated with excluding stuff. That, that's harmful investments like fossil fuels or uh, companies that test products on animals, whereas responsible investment is more uh, looking at uh, using analysis to reduce risk of portfolios. And I'm struck when I talk to, to many uh, people who use the term responsible investing, they don't tend to talk so much about impact of the investment. They talk about risks. They talk about financial risks and how you can use environmental and social factors in order to reduce financial risk. And it calls into question about, so how serious are they about the real world impacts of these investments? Because um, most people, when they hear the term ethical, when they think about responsible investment, are actually, yes, they want decent returns, but they're also worried about the real world impacts. So do you associate ethical investing a bit more with exclusions and responsible investment a bit, bit more with ESG analysis? Is that, is that the, the, the a dividing line? Well, a bit like 
with the question, you know, we sort of relate to where most people in the public are coming from. And, and my clients, you know, and I've got several new prospective clients this week, and they relate to ethical and they say, these are my values. So yeah. I'm looking at value and values and they relate that across the board. And for most of them, they say, my value is that I want to make a difference. I want to have an impact. And they look at structures like the responsible investment world and the principles for responsible investing, the PRI is a global organization that does mainly focus on the wholesale, the institutional end, but they've recently come up with a new framework where they say they're not just going to be looking at risk and return, they're going to be looking at real world impact, going from 2D to 3D, opening up this whole another world and looking for their fund managers to report on that. So for me, you know, we can use it interchangeably, ethical investment, responsible investment, impact investment. We don't get too hung up on sort of precise definitions because everyone seems to have a different definition. But basically we bring it down to our clients and say, well, what is it that's important to you? And we can categorize different products in terms of their level of impact. So in the Sustainable Finance Forum report that you know, we've been working on together, Barry, I think people want to look at this in more detail, they can see a spectrum which starts off with agnostic, you know, traditional finance. And like, they don't care what that impact is. You know, God's which, which, is, which is a fair, fair chunk of the finance world. That's yeah. right. Now, then there's a step up to what's called integration. So yes, they are thinking about that, as you said, Barry, in terms of, you know, how can we reduce the risk and potentially increase the return? But then there's another step up in terms of saying, what can we do in terms of sustainability, thinking about stakeholders and really making an impact in the world? And we can keep on taking that ladder up, if you like, or the level of health of the portfolio, the level of ethicality or responsibility or sustainability. And we can find those funds that are really pioneering. And then we can talk to clients about where they want to sit on that risk return spectrum, issues like diversification and the like. But we can drill in fundamentally on saying, yes, we want to make money, we want to reduce risk and increase return, but yes, we want to have a positive real world impact. We don't want to cause any harm and we want to do good. We want to do well and do good. And in many cases, we can argue you can do well by doing good. And that old hairy chestnut of you know, performance, which I know you've addressed in other presentations in the series, is certainly something that we can talk through with clients. I just had a fresh call this afternoon from someone who rang up and she said, oh, you know, I've seen this podcast, a recent podcast, and I told her about this one. And she said, it's so great. I'm sharing it with all my friends. She's an elderly retired lady and she's $2 million. And she said, it's all great. It's all exciting. I was into this in the 70s. It was cool. But what about the financial return? Can you get me a decent return? And I said, of course, you know, you can have your money make a difference it can matter and you can achieve your lifestyle and personal goals at the same time so that's the good news if you like that that's exactly right and and we you know at the start of this series we had done some analysis on what's happened to ethical funds during the during the covid crisis and we did the analysis and and we found that that the ethical funds on the mindful money website had actually done far better a significant increase in return over the average for the KiwiSaver funds. Admittedly, it was only over a quarter, uh, but that's echoed not only uh, from longer time series data, and now there's kind of a mountain of data showing that ethical funds do very well. And I think the usual frame, framing of it is they do at least as well, if not better. Than, than conventional funds. So, so uh, and that's echoed in international funds as well. Um, the other part of Andrew's question, uh, which I also thought was really interesting, is, is the classic debate around active versus passive. So people, people may know about passive funds as, as kind of investing in the index across all of the shares. Where do you sit on uh, an active fund management versus the passive fund management dilemma. <laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting one. And again, you know, as an independent person, <laughs> I really don't mind, you know, it's up to the individual investor and I can, as the doctor, the money doctor, I can say, well, here's the pros and cons of active, here's the pros and cons of passive, and here's how we can go about addressing them. In terms of the passive side of things, from an ethical investment perspective, 
we can look to those fund managers who have defined their passive index that they're following in relatively rigorous terms. And actually just in the last few weeks, we've brought in onto the platform in New Zealand from Australia, a couple of key funds that have 200 stocks in Australia, 200 stocks globally, all in an indexed passive investment manner, but very rigorous criteria with leaders that you don't see in the indexes that have a lower bar and a lower standard. And there are issues to sort of talk through around that. You know, you've got other styles of funds management, which are not purely passive, but look for things like smaller companies, undervalued companies, more profitable companies. There's an organization that works pretty much exclusively through financial advisors and has sustainability versions of their funds. Well, where do they fit? Are they rigorous enough for a particular investor and their needs? And then we've got other organizations who've gone very low cost with their index, but relatively low bar in terms of how much they're excluding and how much they're engaging. So I'm, again, not making a value judgment about that. But if we get to the high impact end of the spectrum, then typically we're needing to look to at least include some active management because we've got portfolios with 50 to 70 companies who are pioneers in developing sustainable development initiatives, addressing those UN sustainable development goals. They are not just sitting in an index. They are sort of mid-sized companies who are faster growing. They're very innovative. And if you want to tap into those, you need to pay a higher fee because you've got fund managers who are much more engaged and active going out and researching those companies involved with those companies. But for many of my clients, they find that part of the portfolio the most exciting because they're companies they can really see very tangibly making a difference. So oftentimes it's a combination for us of the passive and the active and really working out what works best for a particular client. So somewhat agnostic depending on what works, kind of kind of like the, the Mao Zedong saying, I think it was Mao Zedong who said, I don't care what kind of cat it is as long as it catches mice. <laughs> yeah, so, and, um, and again, the, the key thing here is despite all the industry getting all uptight about different definitions. It's the investor's money. If the investor can understand, you know, what the pros and cons are of the different options, if they've got that independent buyer's advisor, the money doctor, explaining them to, to them clearly, i not having a vested interest in just pushing version X or Y. If you go to an active manager, of course, they're going to say to go active. If you go to a passive manager, of course, they're going to say passive. If you want someone who can stand back and say, well, you know, given your objectives, given where you're wanting to get to where you are now, given your risk profile, your ethical profile, this is what's on offer and this is how we can work together to combine and develop an optimal solution for you. So for me, it's all about what the client wants, but as an expert, being able to really understand what's available and make the best options available to them. Yep. So um, we've probably got time for, a, for a, just a quick last question. Uh, so, um, Noel Josephson, hi, hi Noel, thanks for, for joining us. Um, Noel said um, uh, New Zealand's kind of up there and being a country that recognises social and environmental issues, but it seems like with socially responsible investment, we're, we're, we seem to be kind of missing a whole lot of tricks and, and behind uh, many things going on uh, in the rest of the world. Do you think there's a disconnect or are we in the process of closing the gap? Yeah, well, there's certainly a disconnect. And, you know, if I reflect back to the 70s and the chicken and the egg um, mm. scenario that's kind of been around for a long time, this notion that we vote with our money and we do that you know, with how we invest and really bring that home for investors is still something that a lot of people have yet to take on board. People increasingly recognizing that with their consumer decisions, they're thinking you know, about that a little bit more in a political context, but we really need to think about it with our money, that where we invest our money really does matter. And I think now the sort of excuses like, oh, well, there aren't enough options available, et cetera, et cetera, they're no longer really feasible. When I think about my early clients, these people were really passionate pioneers. They were sort of progressive individuals who are willing to put their money where their mouths were. They were willing to invest in these overseas funds. They were willing to do whatever it took. And they've been really instrumental and continue to be with bringing new funds to the market. But for any investor in New Zealand now who wants to make money and wants to make a difference, they can. We need mindful money to be 
continuing to beat the drum. We need the Responsible Investment Association to do its work. And we need more advisors to get on board and raise this proactively with their clients, not just wait for the client to raise it and then freak out if they do. You know, just basically we need as many people as possible, everyone watching to share the podcast. And it's, it's going to take a lot more publicity, a lot more engagement, but I'm very heartened by what's occurring. It's been you know, quite a journey since the 70s and very thrilled to see the younger generation coming through, the new options that are available, the fund managers who are taking leadership in this field. And I think together, you know, we really can make a very big difference. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Roger. Thanks for joining us and, and for all your work over many years to pioneer this kind of so often on TV and radio and in the papers, you've been kind of the voice who's you know, had the drumbeat of saying, yeah, you know, we can do more ethical investing, more responsible investing, and and it's uh, it's great that you've been playing that role. So thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um, I really appreciate your leadership. Cool, cool. So so for all of you on uh, 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 on the call, we've we've got a uh, a panel next week, uh, which picks up on this whole argument around uh, environment, social, and governance approaches to responsible investment. Uh, we've got the kind of three of the leading exponents on it. We've got, uh, uh, we've got the, uh, the head of, of Mercer, so uh, Philip Houghton Brown. We've got uh, the chief investment officer of Kiwi Wealth, uh, uh, Simon O'Grady, and we've got Rebecca Swan, who's responsible investment analyst at, at AMP Capital. So we're going to be talking about how they do this, how they engage with companies, how they push them to go further. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting session. It's a panel session. Uh, I think it'll be sparky and, and we'll get some discussion going amongst the three of them. So please join us 4 p.m. next week. Uh, if you want to revisit this, uh, the, uh, the YouTube version will be up on our website pretty soon, uh, along with a summary of the discussion. Once again, thanks very much uh, to Roger. Thanks to everyone uh, who's joined us today. Actually, Barry, uh, if I could just say that on a final note to yes. anyone watching, um, in addition to the disclaimer, which is about to pop up, I've got several resources, chapters, books, and seminars and things that it's got my website link there and email. Feel free to be in touch with any questions you've got from today or anything else, and I'd be more than happy to respond to you. There's more resources. Obviously, we could only cover so much today, but I look forward to hearing from anyone who wants to follow up. Yeah, thanks for reminding me, Roger. This is uh, Roger's disclaimer statement. So uh, 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 thanks again to the FMA for, for your clear rules and procedures around this. <laughs> and thanks to Roger for joining us. So uh, join us next week and go and have a look at Mindful Money. Uh, for those of you who are looking for personalized advice, you better call Roger. Uh, thank, thanks a lot, everyone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>